delighted that we have Kate Lineberry here to talk about her book, The Secret Rescue, which we've just seen this fabulous trailer for. The book is available um, here uh, in the room. Kate will sign afterwards. Uh, very excited about this story. It's so interesting. Someone who kind of didn't get it was asking me, I don't what's it about? And I said, it's kind of like Lost meets Grey's Anatomy <laughs> and Nazis, you know? So we're, we're just, it's so cool. And uh, it's delightful to have her here. She's had a, a great writing career. She was a staff writer in Europe editor for National Geographic magazine and the web editor for, for Smithsonian magazine. And I didn't even realize she had written an article that I loved until we were emailing back and forth and she said, oh, well, I became a fan of the museum in 2007 when I was writing about Virginia Hall, the limping lady, and I worked with your executive director, Peter Ernest. So I said, oh, you're fantastic, such a, a great interest in espionage, terrific writer, and my pleasure to have her here today to speak. Thanks, Kate. Thank you for that great introduction. Um, I wish I could tell you all that James Bond was a part of the story, but he was not. But we have our own set of heroes. So I just wanted to start by thanking the Spy Museum for having me here today and for all of you for coming, particularly at lunchtime. I'll begin by set setting the stage for how the 30 Americans arrived in Albania, which is just across the Adriatic from Italy and north of Greece. I'll then discuss the daring rescue, read a small section from the book, share some photos, and end with any questions you may have. Can you hear me okay with the microphone? Okay. In early November 1943, 13 flight nurses and 13 flight medics boarded a C-53 transport plane with a four-man flight crew. The nurses and medics were traveling from their headquarters on the island of Sicily north to Bari, Italy, where they were scheduled to pick up wounded and ill patients from near the front lines and transport them to more fully equipped hospitals around the Mediterranean. Bad weather had plagued the area for the past three days and patients had piled up. Though the weather was sunny and clear that when the plane took off that November morning, the aircraft soon encountered a violent storm that pushed it off course. The flight crew managed to avoid the dangerous water spouts that formed around them, but they were disoriented by the weather, had lost communication with the station at Bari, their destination, and their instrument panel was malfunctioning. After several hours in the air and not realizing they'd crossed the Adriatic, they decided their best chance of survival was to land the plane. They saw an airfield with German planes that looked like they had been abandoned as so many had during the war. But when they attempted to land, the plane suddenly came to life and the Americans found themselves under fire. The pilots quickly ascended the aircraft only to find themselves in the path of German fighter planes. The routine two-hour flight had turned into a five-hour journey and the pilots were now dodging enemy planes without any weapons to defend themselves. They ducked in and out of clouds in an attempt to evade the fighter planes and eventually found a small patch of land where they could a small patch of land near a lake and nestled between rugged mountains where they could land. As the plane creamed along the ground, still saturated with water, the landing gear slowly sank in the mud until it was completely submerged, bringing the, the plane to a violent stop. The force embedded the plane's nose in the marshy land, and the fuselage hovered in the air upright for a few seconds before falling to the ground in a belly flop. The crew chief, who had been in the back of the plane and was not buckled in as the other passengers had been, was severely injured in the crash. The passengers tried to get their bearings and eventually exited the plane to find they were surrounded by rugged terrain. Within minutes, a group of rough-looking armed men dressed in homemade uniforms came out of the woods and surrounded them. This began the Americans' months-long journey in which they faced a barrage of life-threatening incidents, had very little food for weeks on end, and were forced to hide at night with villagers who risked their lives to help them. During one German attack, which occurred within a week of the crash landing, three of the nurses were separated from the others. Not knowing if the three women were alive or dead, the rest of the party had no choice but to con continue to wander through rugged terrain, tired, hungry, and ill, looking desperately for a way to escape. For weeks, they were led through one village after another by Albanian partisans, members of a resistance group who found them food and shelter. At times, the Americans weren't sure who they could trust. The partisans seemed to be using them as propaganda for their cause rather than helping them escape. 
Meanwhile, the Army Air Forces scrambled to find out what had happened to the missing plane and its passengers. The Army Air Forces sent out search planes throughout the Mediterranean, but there were no signs of them anywhere. The stranded Americans quickly learned that Albania was a small country, just about the size of Maryland, which had changed very little over the last several hundred years. German troops had occupied Albania after Italy surrendered to the Allies in September 1943, just two months before, and thousands of abandoned Italian troops, many of whom wouldn't survive the coming winter, still wandered the countryside. The Americans also learned that tensions between two Albanian resistance groups, the partisans in the Bali Comtar, had erupted into a civil war and was as much of a threat to them as the Germans. After 22 days, the American men and women finally located a British officer who escorted them to his mission's camp. Though the Americans didn't know it, the men at the camp worked for the Special, Clandest Special Operations Executive, Churchill's secret clandestine army. The British soon contacted SOE headquarters in Cairo, who then relayed the information to American officials in OSS, the precursor to today's CIA, and our nation's first intelligence agency. OSS had sent its first men into Albania to assist the British just a few weeks before, after setting up new headquarters in Bari, Italy. Having men in Albania allowed them to establish a vital communications link to Bari that would be critical in coordinating the desperate rescue mission. OSS quickly devised a plan which involved sending in an officer to help get them out. That man would be 24-year-old OSS officer Lloyd Smith. Smith had been stationed in Egypt for almost a year and had been promoted to captain when he was recruited by OSS in Cairo in early September 1943. An OSS recruiter promised Smith the excitement he craved, particularly because his brother Clayton was headed overseas to serve as a pilot on a B-26 B bomber. Smith later wrote, unless I did something more exciting than ordnance, I would have trouble living with him when we got back home after the war. <laughs> Soon after Smith arrived at OSS headquarters in Bari, Italy, his commanding officer said, we have a priority job. Do you want to volunteer in Albania? Though Smith knew little of the train or the language, he agreed to locate the stranded Americans and bring them to the coast for a sea evacuation with just a three-hour briefing under his belt. Smith received his orders on November 30th, and by the evening of December 2nd, he had already made two attempts to cross the Adriatic by boat from Brindisi, another port city southeast of Bari. When his second attempt had been canceled that day because of the discovery of German mines in Brindisi's port, he decided to go back to the OSS office in Bari to wait until the area was cleared. He had just arrived when the Germans unleashed a massive air attack on the harbor just three blocks away that would later be known as the Second Pearl Harbor. Smith was fortunate not to be hurt. At least 1,000 people, including civilians, were killed, countless people were injured, and 17 Allied ships were destroyed. On Smith's final attempt to reach the coast of Albania, he took a British motor fishing vessel under the cover of darkness and wearing the uniform of a captain in the Army Air Forces to help support his cover story as a downed pilot if the Germans captured him. The treatment of a prisoner of war was far better than that of a spy, particularly with Hitler's commando order of October 18, 1942 in place. The order demanded that all Allied men caught behind enemy lines be killed immediately, a policy that violated international law. After five days of waiting for information about the location of the American party to come over the wireless from Bari and Cairo, Smith decided to see what he could discover on his own. With a 45 caliber handgun, a compass, maps, and a shepherd to guide him, Smith set out on his mission. While Smith searched for the Americans, the SOE, in coordination with OSS, assigned two men to escort the Americans to the coast for a sea evacuation. After days camped at the SOE's headquarters, the party left in the hands of Lieutenant Gavin Duffy and Sergeant Herbert Bell. Duffy, whose dark hair, slight build, and Clark Gable mustache gave him a distinguished appearance and made him look far older than his 24 years. He led the group along with Sergeant Herbert Bell, a quiet, baby-faced young man from North London who acted as the wireless operator. It was December 7th, the second anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor. They spent days walking with little food and the Americans were more exhausted and ill than they had ever been. On Monday, December 20th, the Americans' 43rd day in Albania, they learned they would have to start backtracking because of nearby fighting between the Germans and the partisans. 
It was too much for some, including the American pilot, who asked Bell, the British wireless operator, to send a message on his behalf asking for an air evacuation. Cairo received the message and forwarded it to the Army Air Forces. The Americans camped out for several days in the same mountain villages, hoping for an air rescue. And with that, I'll read the prologue, which is, uh, takes place the morning of the attempted air evacuation. On a chilly overcast December day in 1943, Gavin Gary Duffy, a tough, no-nonsense 24-year-old special operations lieutenant working for Britain, peered through his binoculars from the cover of an Albanian hillside and watched in frustration as waves of German troops and tanks moved through the steep and winding roads of a town on the valley's other side. The town was purchased high above an airfield, an abandoned airfield, where American rescue planes were scheduled to land that morning in a risky and dramatic mission to evacuate a group of stranded American men and women. The party had been lost for 52 days and was barely surviving the treacherous winter landscape while evading capture by the Nazis. As Duffy continued to watch the activity across the valley, three German trucks and one armored car drove from the town and parked near the main road that ran in front of the airfield. Now he was certain it was too risky for the rescue planes. With no way for him to communicate directly with the pilots, Duffy's plan had been to signal that it was safe to land by laying out yellow-orange parachute panels from a supply drop to make large X on the field. Now that the Germans had moved in, there was nothing he could do but wait with the others and watch. His party of exhausted and ill men and women, riddled with lice and worn out from weeks of traversing Albania's rugged terrain while eluding the enemy, stood near Duffy and his wireless operator as cold wind cut through their filthy, tattered uniforms and blasted their malnourished bodies. They were now so weak from hunger, sickness, and despair that the several miles they had walked from their village hideouts in the rugged mountains that morning to meet the plains had turned into a slow and grueling journey. Some of the men who had volunteered to help Duffy give the prearranged signal to the planes nervously fingered their pieces of parachute. The others continued a silent vigil. Then at half past noon, the sudden roar of multiple planes filled the air. Seconds later, three Lockhead P-38 Lightning fighters, nicknamed Fork-Tailed Devils by the Luftwaffe, flew so low over the airfield that the weary group huddled on the hill could see the pilots' faces. <coughs> A Vickers Wellington, one of Britain's most famous and durable bombers, its machine guns poised for action, suddenly appeared as well, and it buzzed down the airfield, ready to provide cover for two C-47s that followed behind. Not only were the Americans coming to their rescue, so were the British. More twin-engine P-38s came in threes until 21 planes filled the gray sky. The men and women stood transfixed by the huge display of air power. It was the most glorious sight they had ever seen. None of them had expected so many planes, certainly not Duffy. They were amazed at the effort being made to save them, and they were even more affected by the stark reality that they couldn't signal the planes to land. With each passing second, their hopes of rescue were further shattered, and they were overcome with feelings that had become inescapable, frustration, loneliness, and heartache. It would be many more days and many more obstacles overcome before the OSS and SOE had completed their rescue mission and rescued 27 of the 30 Americans. OSS officer Lloyd Smith eventually located the party, being led by SOE officer Duffy after Smith had searched for a month and faced his own life-threatening hardships. As the highest ranking officer, Smith reorganized the group, putting the slow and sick in the front to allow them to set the pace and together they made an extraordinary push to get to the coast while avoiding German patrols. By the time they reached the coast, the party of 27 had walked more than 650 miles. Weeks later, Lloyd Smith returned to Albania to rescue the three nurses who'd been trapped after the German attack. For his heroic efforts, Lloyd Smith was first nominated for a Distinguished Service Medal, but then awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. His citation reads, for extraordinary heroism in connection with military operations against an unarmed enemy during the period December 7, 1943 to March 21, 1944. Captain Smith's resolute conduct in the face of great peril throughout an extended period in the successful accomplishment of an extremely hazardous and difficult mission exemplified the finest traditions of the armed forces of the United States. <clears throat> 
SOE Officer Duffy was awarded the Military Cross in recognition of exemplary gallantry for his work in Albania. Of his journey with the Americans, he wrote, for the party in general, they behaved splendidly, especially the nurses whose courage and faith were a tonic to the people escorting them on what might have been quite a disastrous journey. High tribute should be paid to Captain Smith, who did magnificent work in the latter part of the journey. Tribute should also be paid to the people of the villages through which they passed, most of whom were extremely hospitable, even when a, re a reprisal by the Germans would be the price to pay. Uh, the bravery and courage of these men and women is what inspired me to write this story, and uh, I just want to wrap up by showing you a few of the pictures from the book and talking a little bit more about the specifics of the story. So the men and women, uh, the nurses and medics, were part of the Medical Air Evacuation Transport Squadron, or MAETS. And in 1942, this was a brand new program in the military. We had never done uh, medical air evacuations before. And so during the war, uh, they transported more than one million wounded and sick troops, with only 46 dying in flight. And you have to remember that at the time, you know, a lot of people were still very fearful of flying. Um, Roosevelt was the first president to fly on official business. So um, the, the volunteers, the nurses and medics, I think were extraordinary for many reasons, including being willing to be on these planes. This is a photograph of the 807th MAETS, and, and this was the group that the nurses and medics were part of. Um, there were 90 personnel in, in there in the 807th, uh, 25 nurses and 25 medics, and then the rest were personnel, drivers, th those kind of people. Uh, they all trained at um, Bowman um, Field in Louisville, Kentucky, and it was very rushed training. They had about six weeks, but they were really um, creating the curriculum on the fly as, as they were being trained. Um, and there was no combat training, so a lot of the nurses had never been in the military before uh, joining MAETS, so they didn't even have the traditional military um, training or, or uh, teaching in, in any of the customs at the time. Uh, some of the nurses, uh, all of the nurses were volunteers, but some of them had been stewardesses uh, before the war, and that was um, a popular thing with the airlines. A lot of them required uh, stewardesses to be nurses at the time because people were so fearful of flying. Having a nurse on board was something they found comforting. Uh, this is Harold Hayes. Um, he was 21 at the time of the crash landing. He's now 91. Uh, he is the only uh, remaining member of the original group of 30 stranded Americans. And I spent quite a bit of time with Harold. He, lives in Oregon, Medford, Oregon, and has an incredible memory. Um, and I went out there for a few weeks to interview him in, in depth, and then fortunately for me, he is very savvy with email and with scanning pictures. So we were uh, communicating almost on a daily basis. Um, it was a real treat to work with him, and, and he's often wanted the story to reach a wider audience, so, uh, so he's pretty excited about it. This is a photograph of Harold showing me the route through Albania. He had mapped most of it, but there were lots of villages that he didn't know the exact name of. Um, we kind of put together, with his memory, um, there were two memoirs written by a nurse and a medic that I also consulted, and using their notes as well as the reports that I found from the agents um, was very helpful. So I think with the exception of maybe three villages, we were able to figure out their exact route. Oops. Let me go back. Um, these are uh, some of the nurses who were in Albania. There were 13 in total. Uh, the nurses ranged in age from 23 to uh, 32. Um, part of their requirements, um, they had to be between the ages of 21 and 35. Uh, there were also weight and height requirements for them as well. This is a photograph of the flight crew. We've got the um, co-pilot on the far left, and then the pilot uh, second over. He was actually only 22 years old and had just been promoted the month before to um, a first lieutenant, so he was the ranking uh, leading officer among the, the group. The nurses were all second lieutenants, and the medics were enlisted men. 
Um, so that created some interesting dynamics. Um, then we have the radio operator, and on the far right is the crew chief, and he was the one who was injured uh, when the plane crash landed. They carried him for quite a bit of the trip on a makeshift uh, stretcher they created from the cargo, the seats in the, in the cargo plane. This is a photograph of a C-47. The Americans were on a C-53D the morning that they crashed, which is almost identical except for the uh, cargo door. Um, but these planes uh, transported weapons, um, personnel, and of course the nurses and medics. What they would do is they would fly to a location, find an empty plane, and then travel back with that, caring for the patients on board. This gives you a sense of Albania's terrain. Um, it's a very small country, as I said, the size of Maryland, but a lot of it looks like that. And that's uh, what they were facing. So um, they had their work cut out for them. They stayed mostly in the mountains because the Germans were actually um, using the roadways. So uh, the Americans were somewhat safe by traveling through the mountains with the partisans, but of course German patrols were frequently um, coming into the mountains, so they always had to be on the lookout. This is a photograph of Barat. It's the first major town they came to um, after just their first few days in Albania, and this is the town. It was about 10,000 residents at the time, and it's where uh, the Americans found themselves in the middle of a German attack on their fifth morning in Albania. They had all uh, been assigned to different homes throughout the village, uh, around the town, I should say, to lessen the, um, the food requirements and the, the difficulty that it would place on the individual families who were hiding them. So they were all scattered when this German attack uh, happened very early in the morning. And of course, three of the nurses never found their way out, and the larger group did not know if they were alive or dead at the time. This is a photograph of Kostaj Stefa. He was uh, with his wife, um, Eleni. Eleni is actually 101 and is still with us. She lives in Italy. And I sent her a copy of the book, which arrived on her 101st birthday, which she was very excited about. Kostaj was one of the partisans who led them for weeks through the, the terrain. Um, there, the Americans at times questioned his motives because he was taking them further away from the coast and their plan was to get to the coast where they would hopefully find a boat that could take them back to Italy. Uh, but I think my take on it is that he was following partisan orders and there were times when the Albanian people found that the, they thought the Americans were part of the first invasion force. Um, an American invasion force was, was now happening. This was proof. And uh, Kostaj and the partisans wanted to perpetuate that idea that help was coming. Um, unfortunately for him, uh, he was um, tortured after uh, saying goodbye to the Americans. The, the, rival partisan, the rival resistance group found him. And um, he survived that, but then was later executed a few years after the war when communism um, took over in Albania. Uh, he had five children. This is one of the telegrams. This is the actual telegram that was sent to Harold Hayes' family, his father, um, alerting him that, uh, that Harold was missing. The families received a series of three telegrams uh, during the, the time that the Americans were missing. Uh, the second to the last one said, they're safe, you'll hear from them soon. And of course, it was months before they actually did. So um, information was not readily available. This is a photograph of Duffy, uh, Gavin Duffy, who was the SOE officer, the British officer, um, being thanked by two of the nurses <laughs> at the hospital. They were quarantined uh, in the hospital for several days while the military figured out what uh, they were um, going to tell the press and where they were going to send the Americans. And this is OSS officer Lloyd Smith, the 24-year-old American who came from Italy and searched um, a month on his own, sleeping in, in caves looking for the Americans. And as you can see, they had a very uh, long and misguided route to the coast. Um, they started in the north um, at the crash site near Chestia, uh, which I visited, and uh, were taken all the way towards the border. 
um, before eventually making it to, to the coast. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions any may, may have. Yes? Where did the three other nurses stay for all that time? Well, my publicist would say, read the book. <laughs> but they were actually kept in a home in Barat, and uh, the family had told them to hide in the basement. Um, and so they were trapped because the Germans did take over the town. And um, I was able to f find a man who was just seven years old living in the house with the nurses um, that whole period. And he actually still had the clock that the nurses had brought from the plane. It was from the instrument panel. Um, and had, he had very specific memories of them. Yes. Oh, and I have a microphone so, we, so everyone can hear. How long was the information classified on this whole event? When did it become public? Uh, well, the reason we called it the secret rescue was because, of course, at the time, um, the Americans were forbidden from talking about it because they didn't want to hurt the chances of any future down airmen getting out. Um, you didn't want to give away their escape route. And then once the war was over and Albania fell to communism, the Americans continued to protect that information uh, because they were fearful that the people who had helped them in Albania, which they're all truly grateful for, um, would be, would be hurt in some way. So it continued to be classified through the 90s, the, the material. Um, and when the group had two reunions in the 1980s, and I know that uh, OSS officer Lloyd Smith attended those and, um, and had the reports but would not share them because they were classified. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> How did the story come to your attention? Uh, I was uh, doing a story for actually Smithsonian Magazine on World War II and came across a newspaper article um, on it, a uh, his historic newspaper article, and was just so intrigued by the idea of 13 nurses being part of this because I've heard stories of downed airmen finding their way back um, to Allied lines, but I'd never heard about these women being part of it, and I wondered, you know, what were they doing there? Um, how did they get involved? What were the dynamics like? And when I found out that Harold was still with us and was very willing to work with me, that's what made me think there could uh, be potential for a book. How was the language barrier overcome? Uh, well, fortunately for the Americans, there was the Red Cross had set up a vocational school um, in the 30s and uh, early 40s, and some of the partisans, there were very few, but a handful of them spoke English. So it was really a miracle um, that they had that, but the, when they were met by the first group of partisans, um, when their plane crash landed, uh, it only took a few minutes for them to figure out that one spoke a little English, and he told them that they had been ready to shoot down their plane with the machine gun that they had in the woods until they saw the white star on the plane. It doesn't matter. Anyway, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. The first is, what did the medics and the nurses do after they were rescued? And the second question is, the trailer that you showed was just absolutely wonderful, and it it looks like it ought to be a film. Have you <laughs> actually had any, has anybody expressed any interest uh, in that kind of option? I'm seeing Leonardo DiCaprio on there. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm all for that. Um, but uh, yeah, I think there's some interest and it's being shopped around, but you know, it's, these things are slow in the in, in coming. But your first question was, well, it was interesting because when they all left, you know, they were quarantined in this hospital for several days together. The nurses were all in one room, the medics were in another, and they thought they would all get back to Bowman uh, eventually and, and have time to, to talk and, and see each other again. Um, they did make it back to Catania, their headquarters in Sicily, um, but then they were sent all over the country. They had to go back to the U.S. because had they been in another crash landing, they could have been treated as spies right away um, because they'd spent some time behind enemy lines. So most of them, um, there were a few nurses who went back to Bowman um, and helped train more uh, flight nurses. Um, others went off to a variety of places around the country, but they stayed in the military. Yes. Yeah. It seems like there was an awful lot of 
nurses and medics on that one little airplane. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's a great point. Um, normally, they didn't travel that way. It was just because there had been rain for the past three days, and so their commanding officer um, needed to get a bunch of them out to Bari where patients had been piling up for, an, for multiple evacuations. So it, he never did it again, <laughs> I'll tell you that. But um, it was unusual for them to be on, on board, uh, so many on board one plane. One of the medics was just hitching a ride to Bari. You know, they were off and on planes like they were catching cabs um, around the Mediterranean. And he was picking up his paycheck. Um, and it ended up being a long route to get there. <laughs> And then I'll come back. Uh, two questions. One, how many medical missions or how much time had they spent actually in service before this occurred? Um, and secondly, was there any point where the Germans were actually tracking them and going after them specifically? I'll forget your second question, I'm sure, in one second. But um, they actually uh, had arrived. Um, they took a boat over from, from New York um, and arrived uh, in, Af in North Africa in September. And by the time they finally made it to their headquarters in Catania, it was October. So they only had about a month of actual medical air evacuation before the crash landing happened. So it was, um, it was not long. And then in terms of the tracking, we do know that the, the Germans were aware of their presence. I was able to find um, an archival report in the German archives of them actually coming across the plane. And one of the things that the Americans did is they went back um, the second night they were there and burned the plane. Um, there was some um, technology on there they wanted to protect, and they didn't want the Germans to get a hold of anything. So they took everything they could out that was usable and then burned it. Uh, and the Germans were only to f able to find a, a, a radio that wasn't working at the time. But how much it was a concerted effort to locate these Americans as they went through dozens of villages it was not clear from the record. I'm just wondering how they survived uh, medically. I mean, being, you know, obviously 360 miles and not having that much food and medical. I mean, did they get sick? I mean, how did they make it? physically. Yeah, I was surprised that there weren't more uh, physical issues when they got back. I mean, there was definitely someone with pneumonia. They had, um, they all had lice and dysentery. I mean, it, it was a miserable experience, but um, it was the Albanian people who really helped them. I mean, had they not had the people in the villages sharing what little bits of food they had, they never would have made it. And of course, it was only what the Americans had on that morning. It was a very mild November day, so three of the nurses actually didn't even have coats with them. Um, and there were several times when they were caught in blizzards on mountains. Um, so, you know, I just feel like they, they had good fortune with them f a lot of the way. Yeah, um, first of all, did, the, uh, did their commander send more people to rescue and evacuate those poor people that were piled up where they were supposed to be. And second of all, on that map of their route, I mean, it looks like just a hop, skip, and a jump directly to the west to the coast. Mm -hmm. Was there any attempt? I mean, they went way, way the heck out of their way. Is that because of the partisans trying to use them as propaganda? It was exactly that reason. And, they, um, and some of it was also the fact that the country was divided into territory between the two resistance groups that was fighting for power. So a lot of times, uh, Kostaj Stefa, who led them through most of it, would tell them, you know, we have to avoid this area because this is BK territory. Um, there are, you know, there's fighting going on. Um, and a lot of times he would say, no, we're going in the right direction. Um, so by the time the Americans do find the British, um, they get, Stefa sends a, a runner out to locate them because they know they're somewhere operating in, in the country. And uh, the first thing the British officer says to, to Stefa is, uh, why did you bring them this far? You know, we had m British officers operating very close to the crash landing. So, um, you know, there are mixed feelings about that because the partisans did risk so much to help the Americans at the same time they were taking them further from the coast. So it was a complicated situation. But you did, I think you had another question. Was, uh, what happened to the poor people piling up? Oh, um, yeah, they did send uh, more, but the, the morale of the 807th was um, pretty uh, low at this point because, of course, they had lost half of their medical personnel. 
And what I thought was really neat was that a lot of, in, the, in their daily reports, um, I saw that a lot of the guys who were drivers and, and had other roles that were not medical um, volunteered and stepped up to the plate and got trained very quickly and, uh, and started helping. So, but it was, it was tough going for a while because they were operating with only half their people. Anybody else? Well, thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so oh, much, sure. Kate. Thank, thank you. you. And Kate, the book is for sale in the back room, and Kate will be signing there. Right, thank, thank you. you.